I'm going to be very brief, you were pleased to hear. Um, so I did my PhD at Sprue, uh, which is a kind of a hub for innovation studies. I did it in the late 90s, early 2000s, so this is a historical talk to some extent. And um, when I was there, I was very much on the STS side of Sprue to such an extent I felt kind of uh, subversive reading Latour. Um, and uh, I was kind of, the tension between STS and innovation studies was kind of very kind of apparent to me and to some of my other PhD colleagues as well. And so two of us decided to get together and write a paper on the tensions as we saw them. And uh, we wrote a first draft. Uh, this was rather a long time ago. And then we got distracted by other things, and we haven't done anything with this draft paper. But now, since there's this kind of resurgence of interest in the relationship between these two fields, uh, I'm just going to revisit some of the key points and see if you think it's worth me pursuing this paper, or if it's all been said already, or if it's a kind of historical case study, maybe. So we started off thinking about the historical oppositions that both innovation studies and STS kind of grew out of. And as we've heard... Um, innovation studies is, to a large extent, a reaction to neoclassical economics and the exogenous nature of um, technology, which is treated as, as a residual and not a component of economic growth. Uh, STS is very much a reaction to Mertonian sociology and traditional philosophy of science, which said that science was something that could not be subjected to sociological analysis. So what both of these did is they put science and technology centre stage in their work. But there are clearly key differences between them. The disciplinary backgrounds of the researchers are very different. So innovation studies tend to attract people from management, economics, uh, engineering, and uh, STS from uh, history, philosophy, anthropology, sociology. Also, the centrality of constructivism to STS is really important. And this is regarded often with suspicion by those in innovation studies. Constructivism doesn't fit very well with economics, I think. Um, and then the centrality of economic growth, and a kind of, when I was at Sprue anyway, an idea that economic growth is a good thing, that uh, innovation leads to economic growth. And this was not regarded, or is not regarded as uh, adequately critical by um, people in STS who are interested in the relationship between knowledge and power. So also what we decided to do in this paper is kind of trace back some of the history of these disciplines. And I don't know if you know this textbook, which can be kind of thought of as the origin of, of these fields, uh, published in 1977 with a huge range of different authors from sociology, history, policy studies, and Chris Freeman there from uh, evolutionary economics. They distinguished two fields, social studies of science and science policy studies. So innovation studies is nowhere to be seen here. And I think, quite tellingly, they point to, across all these fields, a burgeoning discontent with all kinds of linear models, one-factor explanations, pure descriptions, and polarised concepts. Then there was the handbook of STS, uh, which you're probably familiar with. And this was very much for the science and technology studies community. So here they note, in the introduction, the absence of distinct contributions on the economics of science and technology. David Edge has a chapter in this book, chapter one, called Reinventing the Wheel, and he describes science policy as rational, technocratic, and quantitative, and the sociology of science as critical, reflexive, and qualitative. So this is quite dichotomous and also quite um, negative towards science policy in this particular paper. Then there was the Handbook of Science and Technology Studies, which came out in 2008, and again, they say um, something we've heard already. A division between studies of science and studies of science policy has endured for 30 years to their mutual impoverishment. While the divide remains, the present handbook offers new opportunities for dialogue. And one of these opportunities is presented as the normative turn in STS, which is described as urgent attention to issues of public participation, power, democracy, and governance. But they do say the core challenge remains how to bring the distinctive insights and sensibilities of SCS into the analysis of policy and the process of social change. We looked for innovation studies handbooks as well, and we only came across this one. I think the more recent book that Johan showed um, would fit into a, a kind of analysis as well. Um, here they point again to the kind of terminological issues about who these people are. They say early groups dedicated to the study of innovation de developed under other, at the time, more acceptable terms such as science studies or science policy studies. And they also say 
Um, again, the innovation has been studied by different communities of researchers with different backgrounds, and the failure of these researchers to communicate more effectively with one another has impeded progress in the field. So everyone seems to be talking about how we need more discussion and more interaction between SDS and innovation studies. Um, one way of kind of encouraging that interaction is to look at shared concepts. And I'm not going to go through these, but I do think that ideas like tacit knowledge, dynamism and change, heterogeneous networks and users are found in innovation studies and in STS in kind of different ways, but interestingly similar ways. Then we also decided to do some bibliometrics, partially kind of slightly reflexively because we know that this is a tool that is used in uh, innovation studies. And what we did is we tried to identify authors who had published in both STS and innovation studies. And we defined it in terms of these journals. So innovation studies is research policy and industrial and corporate change and STS journals as social studies of science and STHV. This is obviously a quite a kind of crude measure, but we looked at the, all these authors had published in both journals to some extent. So the, the kind of further towards the right they are, the more innovation studies -y they are. So some of these dots have more than one name attached to them. There were 162 authors who published in one, in both sides of this kind of a, uh, dichotomy. And I only labeled the dots with one name sometimes. So if your name isn't on there, don't be annoyed. Um, so this was our kind of where we got to in our kind of analysis of some of the overlaps between the disciplines. Uh, but then I think this, like I said, this was done rather a long time ago. And Ben Martin came and gave us this seminar last year. And he talked about the challenges to innovation studies. And Johan talked uh, about similar issues. And these were just some that really resonated with me. And so what I realized is that my image of innovation studies was a little bit out of date, and it's actually become much more reflexive. Also, he said that if innovation studies wants to be more critical, it needs stronger links to SDS. So my final point is that perhaps what we're seeing here is a normative turn in STS with more attention to governance and policy issues and a reflexive turn in innovation studies where innovation is not just single-mindedly pursued because it's assumed to be a good, but where there's a more nuanced understanding of uh, the directionality of innovation. And maybe these kind of areas of innovation, responsible, inclusive, social and slow innovation, are areas where we could have um, a kind of productive intersection between STS and innovation studies in the future. Thank